All right, good morning, good morning. And uh, if you, if you want to get closer, you can. You know, you can come over here where I can look at, look at you in the eye. Okay. Uh, the outline is in the chair over there. I hope you've gotten that. And it, it is a different outline than the one we had last week. So we're going to just keep this truck moving. And uh, if I don't get through an outline, you can uh, take it home with you. Uh, since we have a limited amount of time together to discuss this subject. Uh, so as you're, as you're settling in, uh, let me go ahead and ask you if you would open, your wor- open the Word to Jonah 1, because I'm going to refer to that. That'll be the first passage from uh, God's Word that I'll refer to in a moment. And remember the class is about God's will. It is about how God speaks, how we interpret God's providential leading. And we're asking questions about Uh, the interpretation of signs. Does God give us nudges? Uh, Does God communicate to us an individual sovereign will? And uh, if you weren't here last week to get the introduction, I think it's available uh, on on the uh, internet. Is that right? Yeah. So you could you could go back and uh, you can suffer through that if you uh, need to catch up on what we're doing. God's will. And you might remember that we've re- suggested some books to read, and if you have any questions about those, I won't really talk about that, but I've given you uh, some books to look at if you want to pursue this subject uh, a little more closely. And the one that I would recommend, as I said last week, the, the simple one is Dr. Sinclair Ferguson's book on finding God's will. Uh, next level would be uh, the one by Bruce Waltke. And if you really want to put your combat boots on, uh, the last one would be the Friesen book, but you don't, you don't have to get those, and I'll try to distill some of the things they've said. Uh, let's pray as we get started uh, this morning and give the Lord thanks for such a good day that we have. Father, we do thank you for your love for us that we feel, that we are aware of, that your spirit in a wonderful, mysterious way communicates to us. And we know that there is a witness that he bears to us that we are adopted sons and daughters of God. And we pray for that assurance to grow in our hearts as we gather today. We pray uh, that not only in this hour, but in the hour to come, that your word will speak very clearly to us. And that we'll find uh, the Spirit's power to illuminate the word very uh, present with us today. And Father, bless all that we do, those that are teaching our children and youth this hour. Uh, And then all that will happen in the service of worship, those who lead us and uh, all those who are gathering together in your name, that we might experience in a wonderful way uh, your wonderful presence, your power and love. And now teach us to know your will. Teach us, Father, to uh, change our thinking where that's necessary and bless the fellowship that we share as we answer and try to or ask and try to answer the great questions of the faith. And we thank you for this hour in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's jump in and sort of refresh our, uh, our memory from last week. The question we're asking is how many aspects of God's will are there? And, uh, you know, we, we think about God having one will, one uh, overarching will, but traditionally there have been three ways to categorize God's will. And we talked about God's sovereign will, uh, His will of decree, which no one knows, you know, the secret things belong to the Lord, the things revealed belong to the sons of men, and that's out of Deuteronomy 29, 29. And then we think about uh, the traditional view says there's an individual will, uh, 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 you know, uh, that's what I want to talk about today, an individual will represented by a dot, and I'll, I'll explain what that means in a moment, represented by finding the dot, finding the center of God's will for you as an individual. And then we know about God's moral will that's revealed in the Ten Commandments and in other precepts and commands God gives. So you contrast the uh, moral or revealed will of God with the unseen sovereign will of God. We can't know that will of God until it happens, right? The moral will of God we know and we are responsible for. Uh, We are not told what the sovereign will of God is, but we are told what his moral will is, and we really concern ourselves with that. But there are uh, those in the the Christian faith and uh, good brothers and sisters, and maybe many of us included, who uh, have, at least in the past, expected God to reveal a specific individual will through some means. And so you can see as we get started, 
The traditional view, which is the one we're critiquing, says that God has an ideal, detailed life plan uniquely designed for each person, which he reveals. Now, look at the asterisk, because I've, I've said I'm going to repeat this week after week after week. We are not saying God doesn't have an individual will for you. All right, so I don't want to be unclear. And so what, what I, I'm not arguing against that. I'm just arguing against the fact that it's revealed. Is it revealed to you? That's the question. And so that's how we're stating it here, that God has a uniquely designed plan for each person, which he reveals to the heart of the believer through inward impressions and or outward signs. Okay? Now, uh, again, I don't want anybody to feel that I'm uh, criticizing you because this is what I have believed for a long time until I began to uh, come into the Reformed faith. And, and so this will hit close to home. And uh, in fact, the sermon, oh man, it's going to be a double whammy day because, you know, I'm going to pop your balloon here uh, in, in talking about if you believe this, you know, revealed individual will. And then if you're hang, hanging on to the hope of the rapture of the church, well, I'm going to talk about that today too. So, uh, you know, I might need to, I might need to apologize uh, for, for shaking you up a little bit today. Uh, but we're always trying to reform our thoughts according to the Word of God. And this is part of the Reformation that, that I've experienced and that uh, many in, in the church have. And this really represents, what I'm going to share today represents the heart of Reformed theology on the will of God. So this isn't weird at all. And in fact, in the sermon, we're going to talk about the coming of Christ, and we're going to try to represent what the Reformed faith has understood about that. So uh, that's, a, that's a way of saying, relax, I'm not trying to pick on you. Uh, but if the Lord challenges you, just go along with it, all right? So here we go. Uh, the main question stated, now here's the question. Does God have an individual will in addition to his sovereign and moral wills for which we are responsible. Okay? It is a will that is distinct from his sovereign and moral will. And to further define it, a will that for every detail of a person's life, that is, God has a will for every detail that is not found in Scripture, but that you can discover it. That's the idea that you can discover it. Now, I gave you the illustration last week of choosing socks. Okay? And think with me about this. I don't know of anybody that holds the traditional view that says you need to seek out the individual will of God for what socks you choose to wear, or even if you choose to wear socks, right? Nobody believes that, right? But what if it comes down to what school you go to, or who you're going to marry, or what job, then we start looking for some sign, right? Isn't that interesting? So the little decisions, we don't worry about those. We're only concerned about God's plan for the big decisions. Now, my point is, why aren't we consistent then? If we believe there is a will of God for every decision that we have to find before we do it, why is it that we don't bother with the little details? You see the question? And let me tell you, if you're, if you're thinking about that, uh, think about something R.C. Sproul used to say, you know, talking about uh, a chain of causation. In other words, you know, if you have a, his, his description was, you know, if you have a, a loose nail, you know, on, on the horse, on the, on the hoof of the horse where the horseshoe is, then the horseshoe will fall off. And if the horseshoe falls off, then the horse might fall. And if the horse falls, the rider falls. And if the rider falls, you lose the battle. All right, so given that chain of causation, is there really any such thing as a small decision? Right? Because at the end of the day, even the socks you wear matter. And so the, those who criticize the traditional view say, why is it that you, you're really intent on finding that perfect center of God's will for where you go to school or who you marry or what you do, but there's no intensity in finding out the small things, see? So that presents a dilemma. Does that make sense to you? Uh, we're just not consistent, and I don't, I'm, I don't think we can be uh, consistent with that. So that, that gives us reason to think about this. Uh, another way to describe this is it's an ideal de uh, detailed life plan that the believer must discover through some means, and that's going to be interesting. 
What, what ways do we typically discern God's will? You know, and I would just, I would rattle these off as a young, as a young preacher. You know, well, you look at your circumstances and you get godly counsel and, and you look for God's providence and all these other things, which a good bit of that's true, but we always looked for some sign of confirmation, right? Some sign. And again, the question is, in the new covenant era, is God giving us those signs? St. Mike, turn right, don't turn left. Mike, marry Carol, don't marry Sally. Mike, go in the ministry, don't be an airplane pilot. You know, is God, does he reveal his plans for us by means of signs outside of Scripture that we have to find? That's the question. And we need to be very skeptical of that. So that's what I want to talk about. Well, another way to express the uh, traditional three will view and again, I'm quoting Friesen here, who is representing that, uh, that traditional view. He says, the Bible, God's moral will, gives most of the guidance needed to make a decision. Okay? But knowing God's individual will is essential for complete leading on the correct choice. Does that make sense to you? So it's, it's by definition... Um, necessary in the tradition of you to look beyond scripture to discover this individual will that God is going to reveal to you now let me stop and ask you again I, I'm not I'm not I'm not uh, trying to get you ag to agree with this at all I want you if you come to this conclusion do it on your own all right don't let me uh, talk you into it I just want to challenge you to think about this okay but what's potentially wrong with that with seeking confirmation of God's will concerning a certain decision outside of Scripture. What's potentially wrong with that? What could go wrong? Say it real loud. You could be deceived by the enemy. Okay, yeah. There's, there's a question as to how we interpret that sign. Number one, is the sign from God? How do we know that? Or is it the result of a bad piece of chicken I had and my stomach's just growling you know uh, how do you how do you know that sign is from God Two, how do you know how to interpret that sign All right and you know an example let me give you an example okay a real funny example from uh, uh, the, this theologian that I've been infatuated with for a long time, you know, like a, a theologian crush on him, uh, Helmut Tielicke. Uh, and um, when, I, when I was reading Dr. Tielicke many years ago, uh, he tells the story of how he chose his wife. You know, really interesting. He had two, two ladies that would, you know, crossed all the, 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 the T's and dotted the I's, and he didn't know what to do, okay? And Dr. Tielicke, of course, lived in German. He was a theology, uh, theology professor, and he was uh, working... Uh, against the Nazis, he was part of the Confessing Church with Niemöller and uh, Bonhoeffer and, and those guys. But he had a motorcycle, and he loved to ride his motorcycle. And he said, I know what, I'll devise a test to know whom I should marry, what God's will is. Near where he lived, there was a long stretch of highway, and at the end of that long stretch was a hairpin curve. And he said, I'm going to take Louise, and I forgot the other lady's name. He married Louise. I'm going to take Louise, and let's just say Sally. And uh, I'm going to take them individually at high speed through that hairpin turn. And the one who doesn't scream is the one I'm going to marry. <laughs> and Louise didn't scream, and he married her, you know. And uh, I don't know what Dr. Tielica was thinking at that time, but if it had been me, I said, well, hey, that's God's will. I mean, I laid out the fleece, right? That has to be God's will. So the question, what's wrong with that? Can you think of anything else besides that we don't know that it really is the right test? We really don't know how to interpret it, but anything else? And now, let me go. I saw Scott. Then I'll go back to Mark. Uh huh? It seems to create a, a conflict with God's sovereignty because if, if He's in charge of everything, and can I make a decision outside of that? You know, can I, can I make the wrong decision? And go okay, yeah. And let me repeat what Scott said because really that's just where we're going to go. Scott says, if God is sovereign over all things, could I really make the wrong decision? Now, now, the answer is yes and no. 
because I could make the wrong decision as to his moral will, but I could never violate his sovereign will. For example, okay, and, and, and at this point, this one may hit close to home, and, and, and again, that, that's not my intention. But one of, in regard to marriage, we have a clear word from God. Now, uh, no matter how you got married or when or to whom, you know, if you're married now, it's God's will. You be happy. You don't worry about it. <laughs> but but let, let's say you've got a young unmarried lady, right, uh, or man, and they want to know what is God's will. Well, they know you shall not marry an unbeliever. There's, I can show you verse after verse. So that's clear, all right? So you could, you could marry an unbeliever and violate God's moral revealed will. But in the, in the big scope of his sovereignty, nothing violates his sovereignty. You see that? All right? Uh, so yeah, that, that's a good point. Mark, what were you thinking about? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so if you didn't hear Mark, he was saying that it leads to paralysis. Because if you're waiting for the, to know you're in the center of God's will, you are probably not going to do much. You're always going to be waiting on confirmation, right? And, you're, and, and he's referencing the book by Kevin DeYoung called Do Something. Isn't that right? And it reminds me, I always quote Al Mohler here. You know, Al said, don't just stand there, do something. You know, do something. And uh, this seems to work against that. If you're waiting for some 100% confirmation, then you're not going to be moving very quickly. Uh huh. Dr. Matthew. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, and let me shoot a bank shot off of that if you didn't hear what, what Matthew was saying. But, he, you know, someone says, God gave me a sign. Well, that obligates us to believe it, right? So I don't think anybody necessarily is, is claiming this, but when you say God showed me or God told me or God gave me a sign, that sounds like you're claiming revelation, that everybody has to agree with. In other words, how can you argue with someone who says, God told me, or God showed me? So we're, we're making a, you know, whether intended or not, we're making a huge claim that, you know, God spoke, I know it was Him, I heard it, I understood it properly. And that seems to sound like Scripture, like Revelation. You see the problem with that? Now, we're not saying God doesn't lead us at all. But it's about how we speak of it. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Wayne. Well, it can also be a trump card against the will of God because if you never sign and they contradict something in Scripture, you're going to go to the really that sign may mean, I really want this. Thing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 And I remember it, to, to what, what Dr. Wayne is saying is that we, you know, we often will use that. Uh, God told me as the trump card against doing what we know is right. And, and one of the great examples of that is, you know, in this, in this thing about marriage, I've had, uh, you know, this is in, in talking to uh, single people. Who, who, and I remember one young lady who said, I know, it's, I know what the Bible says about marrying an unbeliever, but God gave me a sign that he's the right one. So what she's doing now, she's taking that sign and laying it on top of the Word of God. So that's, that's a great illustration of that, that trump card you play. If you say, God told me, well, that's an unassailable argument. Or God showed me. That's just, 
You know, how can you argue that? Uh-huh. Yes, Kathy. That's where we're going to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great segue into what I want to talk about. Of course, we worked this out ahead of time, of course. Yeah. All right. So everybody understands so far the dilemma. Uh, it's how we speak of God's will. It's not that God doesn't have a plan. He does, right? But he wants us to find it in a different way. He's not going to reveal it like this. He's going to help us find it the old-fashioned hard way. And that's what I'll talk about in the next few weeks, so you have to promise to come back. Even if I scare you off today, you've got to come back. Okay, uh, let's do what Kathy suggested and look at some, some examples. And first, let me get you to turn to the... Or I'm not sure what page you have because I have a different version of, of the lesson. But we're looking at key assumptions, and let me just deal with that real quickly. It's important, uh, here's a, a quote from Friesen, it's important to make one's decisions within the larger circle of God's moral will, but finding the dot in the center, God's specific individual, is essential. So that's what we're talking about. We're looking, I mean, I can't remember how many times as a young pastor I said from the pulpit, we've got to be in the center of God's will. And what I meant was, there's this dot, you got to land, like, you know, landing the plane on the aircraft carrier, you got to hit the dot if you're going to be pleasing to God. And I'm questioning that. See, now, the assumptions are, the premise is, for each of our decisions, God has a perfect will or plan. That He will reveal. Okay. The purpose, the goal of the believer is to discover God's individual will and make decisions, every decision, in accordance with it. That's the assumption. The process, the believer interprets inner impressions, outward signs, which the Holy Spirit uses to communicate God's individual will to us. And the proof comes, if you get it right, an inner sense of peace and outward success. All right, any of that ring a bell? Yeah, it rings a bell because that's sort of the default setting among Bible-believing Christians. We think, you know, along those terms. Now, let's take Kathy's uh, clue here and give some biblical arguments for that traditional view. All right? Well, the first, let me just give you, some, give you three, and then we'll go into the Scripture. One is God's blessing. Because you make a decision, and it works out well, and we say, yep, I knew it. Yep, that's the sign that I made the right decision. It pleased God. Because it worked out well. Now, there's a potential problem with that, though. What is that? Does God's will ever not work out well when you do it? How do you define well? Yeah. You know, the Lord sends Paul to Philippi. What happens? He gets thrown in jail. That didn't work out real well for him. Right? So... Be careful with that one to say, you know, oh, it was God's will. And again, oh, go back to the guy scores a touchdown. That's God's will. Hallelujah. You know, uh, but then he drops the ball and fumbles it. And he might be a quarterback for some team in red who runs 79 yards and he drops the football at the one yard line. You know, that didn't happen to anybody I know. But <laughs> and nobody's praising God for that. See, some things don't work out well. Okay, two is... Inward impressions. What do you do with your impressions? Everybody has them. Now, we're going to spend a whole lesson on impressions, but everybody has them. What are they? Now, I'm going to come back to later define those as wisdom, probably, in action. And let me just wait on the definition of that and, and talking about that a bit later. I think impressions are important, but let's define what they are. Are they whispers of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to argue they're not. They can be very valuable, but impressions can be absolutely wrong. Anybody have an impression that was wrong? You had an impression about something or a decision or a person, and then you got to the truth, and it was totally... I've done that all the time. My impressions, oh, no, that was wrong. Yeah, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. So what are they? Well... We're going to get into that. Uh, I, I do think there's a place for them. 
But I'm going to suggest they're not whispers from the Holy Spirit. Because if they were, they would never be wrong. They would be revelation. See that? Okay. Uh, what about peace? What about peace? You know, and I've said that. If I've said it once, I've said it a million times. Well, I don't have peace about that. And what I'm saying is, well, I'm not going to do that. And I'm interpreting the lack of peace as something of a sign. Okay? Now, there are many things we do, and we have a peace about them, and that's fine. Praise the Lord. But do you ever do something in obedience to the Lord that doesn't leave you with peace? Can anybody willing to give an example? <laughs> yeah. Does, you know, I think everybody would agree. I guess we're a little bit shy about giving personal examples, but there's a brave man. You're going to get a mic for this. We're going to record this one, brother. Okay. <laughs> Hello. There you go. And the Lord Sorry. said. Yeah. You can tell I'm not good with this. So Kathy and I have had to go into a situation before that was very hard in a family situation and basically said, we tried to do this, but we believe, let me pick my words carefully, for us, we have to follow this path, okay? And that was a gut-wrenching meeting and we left knowing we did the right thing, but we weren't full of peace. Yeah, you had turmoil, maybe. Yeah, the consequences. And you think about something Jesus said when he said, I didn't come to give peace, I came to bring a sword. To set family members against family members. And so, living as a Christian sometimes produces total turmoil in your life. It just blows everything up. I've seen families completely blown apart because of the gospel. I have counseled young people who said, if I get baptized in public, my family will have my funeral. And they got baptized, and their family wrote them off. That's not peace, right? So be careful about that peace thing, because that's also a trump card. You know, um, I, you know if you've been around uh, preaching a long time and counseling people, you hear a lot of things. And um, many, many years ago, I was a young pastor, and I heard someone say to me, you know, I've got peace about doing this. And what they were doing was something illegal. But no, I've got a peace about it. I've got perfect peace about it, you know. So watch out. All right, watch out for that. Now, we'll, we'll talk about the place of peace in our hearts a bit later, but let's be careful. Now, some biblical illustrations. Jonah 1, look at this. And I think this is what Kathy's talking about. Those who want to defend the traditional view, and in fact, if I were going to defend it, I would, I would do this. I would go to Jonah. Great example. Uh, you know the story. The Lord told him where to go, go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, no way, no way. And he hikes uh, you know, to the, to the beach, uh, to the port. He finds a ship uh, there uh, from Joppa going to Tarshish. And then verse 4, the Lord hurls a great wind out there, and the sailors are afraid, and the sailors have uh, interesting theology, right? Uh, they, they know that somebody's God is upset. They don't know who is the cause. And so what do they do in verse 7? They cast lots, and a lot fell on Jonah. God leading Jonah <laughs> to jump overboard. And so we look at that. Oh, casting lots. Okay, yeah. All right, a sign. Okay, let me give you another one. Uh, look at Paul in Acts 9. And you could probably think of more than I've gotten here, but I'll give you some of the bigger ones. Uh, there are going to be two from Acts 8 and 9, but let's take Acts 9 first and look at Paul. And of course, this is the story of his conversion. And uh, look at the leadership of God. <laughs> and look at how God is revealing, you know, not only to Jonah, but revealing to Paul his individual will. Okay? Um, you know the story. He's on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians. He's confronted by a vision of the resurrected Savior. He is blinded temporarily. He hears the voice. And the voice in verse 5 says, I am Jesus, 
whom you are persecuting, and then listen to the will of God for Paul. Rise and enter the city, and it will be told what you are to do. And of course, he goes into the city, and then he is um, ministered to by Ananias, and then he receives the commission to be an apostle to the Gentiles. That's pretty clear leadership on an individual level, like it was with uh, Jonah, right? Another one is in that same neighborhood. Look at Acts 8, uh, and this is Philip in Acts 8, 26 through 29. Of course, Philip is one of the deacons, and uh, he's an extraordinary deacon. Uh, he's also an evangelist, and he's minding his own business pretty much in verse 26. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, okay? Arise, go south on the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. Ever heard of that place called Gaza? Philistine territory. And he arose and he went, and behold, there was an Ethiopian eunuch there, a court official of Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. And he was returning, or on his way to Jerusalem to worship. Look at verse 29. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go and join this chariot. That's pretty clear individual will. An angel, and then the Holy Spirit speaking to Philip. Now the question is, well, doesn't God still do that? Does he still do that? And we can easily just kind of fall into the idea, yeah, we should look for God to speak through dreams and through signs and through an inner voice, and we should listen for the Spirit to speak, and he'll lead us the same way he led them. Okay, let me get you, this is kind of odd, open your hymnal. <laughs> yep, we're going to sing, not, okay, <laughs> not. I will, the day I lead us in singing will be the day of the second coming. Okay, uh, if you'll turn to the Westminster Confession, this is page 848, Westminster Confession. And th this will be helpful in this discussion about how God speaks, how God leads. Um, um, you can see in, in Article 3, this is on page 848, talking about the, the scriptures there. Uh, the, the, and we'll go in reverse order. But look at Roman numeral uh, 6. Roman numeral 6. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for His own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Now, uh, that's a pretty important uh, thing to remember. Uh, you can see if you go back to um, page 847, and look at the, uh, the paragraph on the right there, page 847, the bottom. Um, this, is, this is a statement that you need to think about, okay? Uh, it's kind of hard to get into it. Let me see where I can start. Well, let's just start in the, the, the last third of that paragraph on the right. Which makes the Holy Scripture to be most necessary. Those former ways of God's revealing His will unto people being now ceased. Now, what that's about, if you wanted to read the whole thing, is that we believe the canon is closed. And it consists of Genesis to Revelation. And God is through speaking. We know what He thinks. We know what He wants. He's written it down. And if He hadn't written down, He doesn't want us to know it, Right? And the canon is closed. So we should not expect new words from God. Right? So technically, technically speaking, we should be very careful about saying God told me. Now, if we mean by that, I was reading Scripture, and I read the moral will of God, and the Spirit has helped me to apply that to my life. Yeah, we speak of Him. He always leads us in the Word. Always in the Word and by the Word. But anything beyond that, there's another category for that, and that goes into the category of wisdom. Now, 
So I'm, I'm going to give you the end of the story uh, where we're going to end up going so you can recognize when we get there. Here's what we're saying. God wants you to develop wisdom. Now, he could speak to you. He could whisper in your ear what color socks to wear, whether to turn left or right, what color car to buy, or if to buy a car, all but he could. But what kind of Christian would you be if God did that? Would you have any faith? Would you have wisdom? No. No, you, you, you would, you'd be a robot, right? You'd be a robot. And so we learn what's pleasing to the Lord in the long process of developing wisdom. Now, how do you develop wisdom? You make bad decisions. Yeah, you, you learn from experience. And the Lord will not circumvent that process in your life. Okay? He is not going to whisper in your ear, go left, go right, no. He is going to make you search the Word of God. He is going to make you develop wisdom. He is going to allow you to make some bonehead decisions with bad consequences. And you'll say, man, I don't want to do that again. Right? He is not going to spare his children the rod. And I could put it in terms that are popular. He is not a helicopter God. Like the helicopter parent that always saves little Johnny from every dilemma. Always answers little Johnny's questions. Little Johnny never has a need. He never does anything wrong. He never has to worry about where to go because mom and daddy are doing everything for him. God loves us too much to treat us that way. And so we will develop wisdom through pain, through making bad decisions and learning to make good decisions and learning to immerse our minds in the Word of God so that we can more likely make a decision that is in keeping with the precepts of Scripture rather than depending on some supernatural word from God that clears up all the fog. He is going to lead us through the fog. Now, here's how we do it. When we need to make a decision, we do our homework. We read the Word of God. And reading the Word of God might rule out some things. There may be some thou shalt nots and some thou shalts. And we can rule some things out. All right? And then we pray for wisdom. And in James, what does the Lord say? Whoever asks for wisdom, they will get it. We pray for wisdom. And then we make our decision and trust God's sovereignty. Now, that's where we're going to go. That's the end of the rope. When we get to the last class, that's where we're going to go. Rather than depending on some supernatural, depending upon some supernatural sign or some confirmation, we are going to develop wisdom, and we're going to make a decision. You know? We'll make a decision and then trust God's sovereignty. Now, sometimes that leads to disaster, doesn't it? But how do I know that that disaster wasn't meant for me? <laughs> I've made some terrible decisions that I'm so thankful for because I could look back and say, God taught me so much. You have to make a decision and then trust His sovereignty. So that's where we're going to go. So let's get back to this point that we should not look for uh, signs and communication from God in the way the prophets and apostles received that in the Old Testament. Let me two other things, then I want to ask you for some questions. Uh, look at the argument from the, the Lord's life. Uh, for instance, in Matthew 15, 20, uh, you know, some people will appeal to this and say, see, here's, here's where we have to seek out some seep, uh, supernatural word from God. Matthew 15, 20, uh, Jesus says, these are the things which defile, uh, wrong, wrong verse, hang on, wait a minute, what am I doing, did I write down the wrong verse? Yes, I did, I wrote down the wrong verse, I hate it when that happens, well, let's go to plan B, plan B is Matthew 26, let's see if that one will work, I knew I needed an editor, yeah, 2639, I think that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, this is when Christ is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He falls on his face. My Father, if it is possible for this cup to pass from me, uh, let that happen, yet not as I will, but as you will. And some will appeal to that and say, well, you know, the Lord is seeking there the, the, the will of the Father. 
the individual will of the Father. Now, the, the problem with that is we, we're not the divine incarnate Son of God. And we should not expect the same kind of communication and leadership from the Father that, that Jesus had, right? Ours is mediated. We don't receive direct words from the Father. It is always mediated through the Scriptures. The Scriptures illuminated by the Word of God. And again, to speak in technical terms, technical theological terms, we don't hear His voice, you see, directly. It's always through Christ, through His Word. He speaks to us. How do I know that? Hebrews 1, 1. In these last days, having spoken in many portions and in many ways in the prophets, in these last days, He has spoken to us in His Son. And we take that to mean that we hold up the Word of God uh, and we re recognize that the Savior is the incarnate Word of God and we look to the written Word of God and that's the only voice of the Lord that we seek. So He's not going to speak to us like he did in the days of the prophets, in the days when revelation was being given, right? Because it was never wrong. It was always clear. Uh, the guidance God gave those uh, patriarchs and prophets and apostles was always supernatural revelation. So there are no recorded examples where detailed guidance was given through a means other than supernatural revelation. Does that make sense? So there was something unique about the prophets and the apostles. And what we have is the written word of God that they didn't have. We have the completed word of God, the final word. And that is sufficient for every decision we make. It is to make us wise unto salvation. Okay? All right. Uh, you can see the conclusions, uh, and I won't get into those other biblical examples and what they demonstrate. I'll let you read that. The conclusion is it's better to think of God's will in two categories. What's not known, his sovereign will. What is revealed, his moral will. And again, making decisions is about reading the word and developing wisdom so that more and more we make good decisions that bring glory to God. Now, let me stop and see uh, what questions you have or what your reaction is uh, to this. And uh, we'll, we'll be talking about impressions and those kind of things and intuition. There's a place for that. Uh, we'll be getting into all those practical things. But I wonder if anybody has a question before we go. Matthew's happy to answer it. So, yeah. <laughs> He's got a question, actually. Yes, sir. <laughs> Oh, there you go. There you go. Okay. Mike, I was thinking a little bit about um, how we tend to seek an ob objective, something out there, sign to validate sort of a subjective experience that we, that we want. So I've already got a want or I have a personal peace that I want to obtain I'm, or I, I want to hide from something. And so therefore, I want, I have something out here to sort of validate that. I was thinking um, that that seems to bear a striking resemb resemblance to secularism in one sense, because yeah. for secularism, my subjective experience is the, de the determination of the reality of th what's around yeah. me, right? That's right. And so I was just sort of thinking about that in terms of the, the religious experience. They sort of have kind of a self-religious experience and sort of Christianity's assumption or counterpart to that my, my I guess part of my question is there do seem it do, there's there does seem to me um, and also a dynamic here where when we're actually seeking God's word for our decision making it actually frees us up to pursue the wants that we have it gives yeah, us some absolutely. liberty to that and wisdom comes to be able to discern between the two. That's right. Does, if that makes any sense. It makes a lot of sense. That's where we're going to go. We're going to talk about also desires. You know, how God does use our desires. Uh, absolutely. But what, what Matthew's saying is, the, is really the thesis of the book by Bruce Waltke. He says that looking for God's will like this is very pagan. It's a pagan notion. That's what he says. Because we are saying, you know, I am the interpreter of the signs. I am the interpreter of what the sign means. 
see. And boy, that's a, that's a pretty flimsy foundation to stand on, right? Uh, and inadvertently, we make, our, we make everything subjective, which means it's about me. So I, I'll determine what the sign means, just like Dr. Tilika determined the sign for who he would marry, right? So it makes it about me and not about receiving uh, God's word that he's already written. So yeah, that, that's a good point. Okay, it looks like it's about time to rapture out of here, right? <laughs> Don't rapture far, because we're going to come back and worship, all right? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you uh, for our good fellowship around your word, and give us clarity of thought, uh, not just, and not just to learn something new, but, Father, to really integrate what we've learned into our lives. Now, bless our fellowship time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. Have a good break.